So what I'm going to present to you is based on a couple of works, a very recent one, just a few weeks ago, and a former one, done in collaboration with my friends Dennis, Katsuya, Fabrizio, Luigi, and Gian Massimo. So this, call, this talk will be about the massive gravity, so I'm pretty lucky because uh, uh, Rachel already gave a, a couple of lectures about massive gravity, so I don't need to spend time in review massive gravity. I just would like to stress the difference with GR. So GR is the unique theory of a self-interacting massless spin to field, and since it's a theory that enjoys the diff invariant, propagate uh, two degrees of freedom. Differently, massive gravity is the theory of a self-interacting massive spin to field. So uh, it doesn't have any diff invariant, so in general there are six degrees of freedom that propagate in the full theory, and uh, as Rachel said, one of these degrees of freedom is, a dangerous, is dangerous and is a ghost, and so we need to enforce uh, an extra constraint in the Lagrangian in order to remove this uh, extra ghost mode and have an healthy theory of five degrees of freedom. So this theory was proposed by Deram, Gabadazzi, and Tolly in 2010, and then showed to be uh, fully cost-free at all order by Hassan and uh, Rachel herself. So what I'm going to show in this slide is a very quick review about the canonical analysis for massive gravity. I'm going to use the, the analysis uh, proposed by Dirac for constrained system and to see how uh, can we construct a Lagrangian that uh, propagates only five degrees of freedom. So uh, let's write down a general Lagrangian in which we have the highest Hilbert term and then a general potential that is a non-derivative function of the laps, the shift, and gamma ij. I'm using the ADM notation. So in this way, we have that, uh, since we know that the einstein hilbert term uh, doesn't contain any time derivative of the laps and the shift, and so also the potential, we have that the momenta conjugate associated to the laps and the shift with the index A, I mean for zero, the momenta conjugate associated to the laps, and the index I is related to the shift. So still, also in massive gravity, we have four primary constraints associated to the laps and to the, that are the momenta conjugate of the laps and the shift. So what we have to do uh, is to enforce the, the primary constraint in the total Hamiltonian through the four Lagrangian multiplier. And sorry if I go pretty fast here, but I don't have time to, to go into detail. So if you have questions, we can discuss later if you, if you want. So we enforce the primary constraint through four Lagrangian multiplier, lambda A, in the Lagrangian, and then we have to take the consistency condition on the primary constraints, that is the time evolution of the primary constraints that is made with the Poisson bracket with the total Hamiltonian. So in this case, we get this relation here that you see it doesn't involve any Lagrangian multiplier. This means that uh, these four conditions here are four secondary constraints because we cannot determine any Lagrangian multiplier from here. So at this point, also for a general theory of massive gravity, we have four primary constraints and four secondary constraints. What we have to do is, again, take the time evolution of the secondary constraint, uh, doing the uh, Poisson bracket with the total Hamiltonian, and what we have is this relation here, where for the first time, the Lagrangian multipliers appear. So in this case, you see that uh, this is the Hessian matrix, so the derivative of the potential, respect to n, a, and b. So it's the Hessian respect to the last and the shift. So we see that if this matrix here, the Hessian, is uh, non-singular, so this means that we can invert this matrix, and we can solve this relation for all the four Lagrangian multipliers. So at this point, we can solve for all the Lagrangian multipliers, we end the procedure, and we stop with four primary constraints and four secondary constraints. So we have 20 canonical degrees of freedom minus eight constraints, so 12 canonical degrees of freedom. That means six physical degrees of freedom. So we have a theory that propagates six degrees of freedom. One of the degrees of freedom is the ghost that Rachel spoke about. So the first important condition to remove the ghost mode is to have that the Hessian matrix is a singular matrix. So the determinant of V A B should be equal to zero. And we will consider the case in which the rank of the matrix is equal to three in order to don't break the rotation. So in this case, this condition here enforces an extra constraint. Indeed, if we call chi the eigenvector associated to the null eigenvalue of uh, the Hessian matrix, this means that if we take the, project, the projection of T A along the null eigenvector, this term here goes away, 
because it's the null and the vector. And so we get an extra non-trivial constraint that I will call T. So this is a, ter a, a tertiary constraint that is needed to remove an extra degrees of freedom. But this is not enough because, again, we have to take also the time evolution of the tertiary constraints, and we will see that we get a non-trivial quaternary constraint if and only if this relation here is satisfied. So this is a partial differential equation for the potential that involves the derivative respect to the last shift, but in this case also the three special metrics, gamma ij, enter in the game, and so, if I give you a general potential that satisfies these two conditions here, so your potential propagates five degrees of freedom. Indeed, it is, this is the final counting. So we have four primary constraints, four secondary constraints, one tertiary constraint, and one quarter constraint. That gives you 10 canonical degrees of freedom, so five degrees of freedom. So in principle, if you solve these two partial differential equations, you find the most general potential that propagates five degrees of freedom. There is also another condition that we have to impose, and is it that your potential is a Lorentz invariant potential. So in this case, as Rachel said, uh, the potential to be Lorentz, Lorentz invariant, he has to be constructed from the invariant of this matrix here, that is g to the minus one eta, that in terms of the tetrad is e to the minus one identity matrix. So in this case, we want to construct the potential that is done from the eigenvalue of the matrix X. This is to enforce the Lorentz invariant. Now, if we solve the two differential equation that I show you for the simplest case of the two-dimensional uh, two space-time, we find that there are only two different potential that uh, propagate five degrees of freedom. So we have only two potential that uh, satisfy the, the relation that I showed you before. So, and up to a constant values, uh, one potential is the sum of the square root of the eigenvalues of x, and the other potential is the difference between the square root of the eigenvalues of x. And now it is easy to realize that these two different potential are related to the different branches of the square root of x in two dimensions. Indeed, here we have, this is a matrix, and of course, uh, we can write down the potential like a function of its eigenvalues, but when we take the square root of the eigenvalues, th they are related to the square root of x. So how is defined a square root of a matrix? We have to diagonalize the matrix. So when we have the diagonal matrix, we see that there are different branches associated with each of the values that I can have in front of the diagonal entries. Now, if we select from this square root here, the branch where square root of lambda one and square root of lambda, and lambda two are both positive or negative, and we construct the trace, so we end up with the DRGT potential. But on the other hand, if we select here a different sign between the two eigenvalues, the square root of the two eigenvalues, we get a different branch for the square root, and taking the trace, we get a different potential. So an important point is that, okay, B plus is Gauss free, B minus is Gauss free, but if I take any linear combination of the two potential, it is not Gauss free anymore. So taking any linear combination of both the potential, we reintroduce the Gauss mode. Now, let's generalize to the four dimensional case that is technically far more complicated, but the principle is the same. So in this case, we found that there are a large class of solution of the two partial differential equation that enforce the propagation of five degrees of freedom. So, and these potential are constructed from the symmetric polynomial of the square root of x once a branch choice has been done. So, we take the square root of x, we go to the diagonal form, so we have different branches that we can select according to each of the sign that we can have in front of each value in, in the diagonal, and so we construct the symmetric polynomial that are function of the trace of the various power of square root of x, and then we have uh, all the classes of the Gauss-free potential. Now consider that if we take this branch here in which all <coughs> the square root value are positive or negative, there is just uh, an overall sign that doesn't make any difference, we get the DRGT potential. In the other case, uh, cases, the potential are different. Again, also in four dimension, the various branches cannot be mixed in order to don't reintroduce the extra degrees of freedom, the ball where this are ghost. So, now, if you want to see a disconstruction from a slightly different point of view, you can use the, the same method used by Hassan and Rosen to show that the, the potential is Gauss free. So in, in this case, what you have to do? You have to, no, sorry, um, you have to redefine the shift where xi 
is the new shift vector in such a way that uh, when you write down the Lagrangian in terms of the new variable, you have that the Lagrangian in linear in the labs. This automatically enforces the primary constraints that you need to remove the extra degrees of freedom. So in this case, uh, this means that you have to solve this equation here, where the matrix A and B are, um, do not depend on the lapse. So in this case, uh, what you have to do to solve this equation is, is to take the square of this relation here, and of course, it will give you a quadratic equation for A and B. And of course, there are different branches that you can select for the solution of A and B. Now, if you look in the, in the nice paper of, uh, of Rachel, in which this method was developed to show that the DRGT potential is Gauss-free, you see that the, the branch choice that they did for A and B directly link to the DRGT potential, but there are also different choices for A and B that are related to the different potential. An important point is that the transformation here that redefines the shift should be invertible. This means that the Jacobian or the transformation has to be different from zero. This condition here selects the value of the ground around which you can expand the various potential because not all the potential admit all kind of background. So let me show this uh, in a slightly dif different way. So now we have, that, we have a potential that is a function of a square root matrix. So in order to have a standard perturbative expansion of that potential, we, we have to be able uh, to express the perturbation of the square root of x in terms of the perturbation of x. And this translates in the solution of this equation here, in which we relate the perturbation of the square root matrix with the perturbation of the matrix. This is a well-known equation in mathematics that is called the Sylvester equation of 1884. And Sylvester gave the theorem that there is a unique solution for this uh, equation here in terms of delta square root of x if and only if the spectra of the eigenvalues of square root of x is completely different from the spectra of the eigenvalues of minus square root of x. So they don't have, they, you cannot have a common eigenvalue between square root of x and minus square root of x. So this theorem here selects which band ground is allowed for every potential. So let me do an example. For instance, if we want that uh, the, the physical metric is uh, Minkowski, so we want an expansion around Minkowski in order to have the, the first power Lagrangian at the quadratic order, and so on, we see that in this case, the X matrix is the identity. So in order to satisfy this condition here and have a standard perturbation expansion, so the only two allowed background for this, the background value of the square root of X are plus or minus the identity. So they are related to only the branch studied by the RGT. So this is a quite nice result because uh, among all the class of, of Gauss-free potential, only the DRGT branch allow a standard expansion around Minkowski. And so it's the only potential that is related with Pauli Firth, but is not the only potential that propagates five degrees of freedom. And uh, an important point, all the potential are non-linearly Lorentz invariant. It's just the background that here we are considering. But if we break the Lorentz symmetry in the background, selecting a different vacuum for the physical metric. So in this way, we are breaking the Lorentz boost and preserving the, rot the, the rotational symmetry. So in this case, there are two. This is the square root, the, the background uh, value for, for the matrix X. So in this case, the Sylvester's theorem tells us that uh, there are two different branches for uh, the background value of square root of X. And you can have two different choices in front of the zero entries of the matrix. So in the case in which you select the plus sign, so this is related to the DRGT branch, but in case you select the minus sign, this is the background value of this other branch in which you have minus square root of lambda one, and this gives you a different potential. So let me briefly analyze this different branch of the potential. So in this case, we are expanding around this background here that say spontaneously break the Lorentz symmetry and a sort of Gaston theorem apply in, uh, in this case. And so we have that uh, uh, three mode that are the vector and the scalar are strongly coupled. Indeed, expanding around that background, the, the, the different potential, we don't have any H0i term and this kind of Lorentz violating massive gravity theory was studied by Rubakov, Duboski, and collaborator. So in this case, only the elicity two mode, so two mode propagate 
because these ones are massless, so for massive gravity, do not propagate. So for what concerns the background cosmology of these different potentials, since at the background level, there is just a, a, a difference of a sign in the zero entry of the square root of x, we have a, a very similar cosmology of the DRGT potential. So we can only have open FRW solution, but this problem can be overcome in the by gravity formulation of massive gravity. But all the, all the phenomenology of the cosmological perturbation as well has no linear solution of this uh, new branches of the potential has still to be investigated. So let me conclude with this takeaway message. The canonical analysis is a very powerful tool for model building. So we can, you can ask the number of degrees of freedom that you want in your theory. You can go further with analysis and see the condition that enforces the number of degrees of freedom that you want in your theory, and then construct a related, uh, a correlated model. So, and what we see is that there is a large class of massive gravity uh, potential that propagate five degrees of freedom. Here I put massive gravity because not all the potential are connected with the Pauli field expansion. But again, all the potential are nonlinear Lorentz invariant. Only the DRGT potential is connected with the Pauli field Lagrangian, that is the one that Rachel showed you the last time. And unfortunately, the, 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 the new branches suffer of strong coupling problem. And this is a, a, a general problem related to the spontaneous breaking of the Lorentz symmetry. And the last point that I hope that they could bring some interesting phenomenology. I don't know. I finished.